Yeah. Yeah. I'll rise. And we'll start with the invocation for Reverend Bob Thompson from Corinth. Let us pray. Oh God, for the incredible gift of life, we stand in awe and wonder. And we thank you for the privilege of sharing that life together tonight. And we thank you for public servants who work so hard day by day to improve the quality of life for all. And we pray for joy in what they do, for a sense of uh, humility in listening to one another and to the community, and for wisdom in the decisions that are made that their consequences may indeed uh, bring peace and stability and prosperity to our community. And tonight we'd especially remember those who are cold, some perhaps due to their own choices, many due to our, our neglect, and we pray that you would give us wisdom to know how to help them in their time of need, and we trust you for the grace that's needed for this meeting in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We start with special presentations. Ryan Lovin from the Business Development Committee. Members of Council, Mr. Crone, Mr. Berry. I'm Ryan Lover and I'm here on behalf of the Business Development Committee of the City of Hickory. And tonight I've got the pleasure to present the Business Well Crafted Award. Um, just a little history on this award. Uh, the Business Development Committee decided that as much as we do for new businesses that come into town, what are we doing for those that have been here and, and really committed a lot of time? So we decided to come up with the award. We've named it Business Well Crafted, and it is to honor businesses in Hickory who have consistently been in business for 75 years or more. Tonight, it goes to the Beisner Company Jewelers. Growing up, Beisner's was that place on the square that all the young ladies would walk past and we'd stop and look in the window <laughs> in hopes that one day, one of those beautiful engagement rings would be ours. And um, we just, they've been here since 1869 and when I stop and think about 118 years, I wonder how many thousands of engagement rings, wedding rings, and generations that are walking around our town and in our region today. I'd like to introduce Tim Klein, if you could come up here, and his daughter Lori Baker, who's also the manager. They've um, obviously do a wonderful job giving back to the community. Um, they focus a lot on the trustworthiness. I know we're very, people have to be very comfortable to bring their jewelry to you and to buy it. Um, the quality and service is appreciated. Hickory, um, the front porch of Hickory, to, in, in my mind, is downtown. And you guys make it warm, you make it welcoming, and you make it shiny. And for that, we are thankful. It's been good. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to sit. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we've been in the news too much lately. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks a lot uh, for Hickory supporting uh, a small business, I guess, for so many years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Ryan says that um, young girls look there, we still older women walk by and say, oh, I wish. It would be so nice, but yes, okay. Thank you very much for what you've done. Um, and now I'd like to call on Councilman Hank Guest for the unveiling of the ceremonial key to the city for Hickory Chair. And before I do that, I'd just like to give you a, a little bit of history of how we got to where we are today uh, concerning the key to the city. Uh, the tradition in Hickory, much like other cities and entities, has been for several years to award or to give a key to the city to individuals and businesses that have made a significant contribution to the city in some form or fashion. Uh, I did a little research and uh, through Google, obviously, and, and found that that tradition 
uh, was adopted in the early 1800s in Europe when cities actually had walls around them and they had gates with locks on them and you had to actually have a key after the, after the city was closed down and the gate was shut. So the tradition started uh, with, with individuals who were deemed worthy and mostly trustworthy of having that iconic key to the city that would actually let them come and go at their own choosing any time that they chose to do so. Uh, I can't remember how long ago it was, but it's been several years. Uh, Mayor Wright asked me to fill in for him at a, at a presentation for a key to the city. And, and for those of you who, who aren't familiar with it, the, the city traditionally has three different keys that the mayor can, can choose which one he's, he's going to give out. We have a, a small lapel pin key to the city and then we have a, another key that they call the medium sized key and then we have another key that's even bigger that they call the large key. Well, on this particular uh, incident, I was given out a, a medium sized key to the city and uh, I couldn't help but notice it's, it's a uh, brass plated generic looking key to the city that I imagine that uh, most cities give out only it has hickory on it instead of some other city. But the thing that, that really concerned me and, and bothered me a little bit was when you, when you turn the key over, not only was it not made in Hickory, North Carolina, but it was not made in the United States of America. So uh, I set off on a, on a little mission to, to try to, to uh, help that and I come up with the idea of having a key made to replace the, the large key that would have uh, some ties to Hickory and our Life Well Crafted logo and the whole concept of craftsmanship. Uh, I couldn't help but recall that during my time spent at the police department that Chief Lucas had summoned the folks at Hickory Chair and asked them if they would make a hickory nightstick, which he gave to individuals from time to time with a plaque. So I, uh, I, I called up the good folks at Hickory Chair and they were uh, more than willing to, to meet with me and, and hear the concept and the ideal. And to make a long story short, uh, I was introduced to, to Tim Adkin, who is the director of manufacturing and uh, Chris Carraway, who's the Vice President of uh, Marketing. And uh, they were, I told them about what I was wanting to do and excited about doing, and, and they just, they came on board immediately. And uh, they, uh, they, just, they just said, that, you know, whatever it is, whatever we can do, we would, we would be more than happy to, to assist with that. So uh, at this time, I would like to invite Tim and Mark Hudson and I think Laura Holland also who is their Director of Marketing Services if you would uh, join me at the, uh, at the podium up here and I'd like to present to them the very first key to the city that was not only uh, made here in Hickory but it was made by the fine folks at Hickory Chair. By the way Hickory Chair is also a recipient of the Business Well Crafted Award that we give here at the City of Hickory. I already mentioned that they made the Hickory Nightstick that the Police Department still gives out today. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, we also used their facility recently for a video, a promotional video, to uh, tell people about the City of Hickory, and we used the facility for that also. Uh, there's, there's, there's also one of these keys on display on the desk over here. Uh, it's kind of, it's, it's unique, specifically to Hickory, obviously. It's a wooden key, and, and I'm sure Tim will be able to tell you more about it than I can, but it's got the uh, Life Well Crafted logo on it. It's got the city seal in it. The key actually uh, is magnetized, and it, and it fits really good on this, on this board. It's like it's presentable. You can hang it, or it's got a little peg where you can put it on the shelf. And it's also, if you look on the back, it's got the stamp and the logo of Hickory Chair. So it's real, it was real important that this key 
not only be made in the United States, but it be made here by our local craftsmen and craftswomen in the city of Hickory. So uh, obviously uh, the mayor and the council and the staff were, they knew about this project, but uh, hopefully this is gonna be a tradition that from now on whenever the mayor deems necessary, instead of getting that large brass plate key, you'll receive this well-crafted key that was made by hand here at Hickory and by Hickory Chair and Cody. So I can't tell you how much this means to me and I just want to take the honor of presenting the very first, uh, the, the mayor's calling it the ceremonial key to the city. So the very first presentation of the ceremonial key to the city of Hickory goes to Hickory Chair and we can't thank you enough. for what you've done. Uh, now, persons requesting to be heard, we have uh, Ms. Catherine Scott has requested to speak. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight, and I'll try to be brief. After 30 years in the Air Force and another 10 as a civilian in the Pentagon, I've chosen to permanently retire to Hickory and have loved every minute of it with one exception, and I'll be talking about that tonight. Um, <laughs> last just fall- Just one exception? With just one exception. That's not bad. That's good. <laughs> uh, last fall, uh, there were three duck hunters who came right into the cove between Geithner and Glen Hilton Parks and were hunting and a uh, very highly populated area. And uh, I called Hickory Police. They suggested I talk to wildlife. And very shortly, I think within 20 minutes, wildlife responded. And I saw them take three weapons away. I saw some exchange of paperwork. And the guys were gathering up their decoys and left never to return. And we thought it was uh, an issue that had been taken care of. But they've been back this year and hunted in that area several times. And I wanted to bring up just a few issues that I think are, are relevant. Number one is safety. Uh, we are a highly densely populated neighborhood within the city limits of Hickory, located, as I said, between the two city parks. The place that they set up to hunt is uh, on the point right below the 100 apartments at Quail Run. Uh, residents in this area are prohibited from discharging firearms by the Hickory City Code. It would seem to follow that the discharge of firearms should not be allowed in the same area simply because they're discharged from the water. Both Hilton and Geithner Parks are routinely frequented by families. Kids are playing, people are walking their dogs, there's traffic going by. And while recreational use uh, does decrease somewhat during the winter, there are still people on the lake recreationally uh, year round, paddle boarders, canoers, kayakers, and some boaters. And I think every possible precaution should be taken to ensure safety to residents and to park visitors. The second issue is noise. Chapter 19 of the Hickory City Code prohibits creation and continuation of any unreasonably loud and disturbing noise within the city. And persons in Hickory are not allowed to disturb the quiet and peace of any citizen of the city. While the discharge of firearms is currently not listed as an expressly prohibited noise, uh, perhaps this ordinance could be uh, amended to include that. Uh, the third area is bird sanctuary. In accordance with Chapter 4 in the Hickory City Code, both of those parks are designated as bird sanctuaries. And there are several known groups of ducks that go back and forth between the two parks kind of all day long. Um, there are seven different uh, breeds of domestic ducks that I've noted, and there may be more. And basically, these three guys are setting up exactly halfway between the 
two parks and are essentially hunting uh, tame ducks. Um, additionally, there are a lot of families and children who really enjoy feeding ducks in both parts. Uh, people are not allowed to hunt baited birds and these birds almost by definition are inherently baited all the time because of their our interaction with people in the two parks. Uh, fourth issue, protected wild birds. Uh, federal law prohibits the killing of non-game migratory birds and protected birds routinely encountered in our little area there are eagles, hawks, owls, vultures, herons, egrets, and woodpeckers. And with the exception of perhaps owls and woodpeckers, which I've not seen, all of the others are routinely seen in this area and adjacent to uh, our cove. And currently there is at least one pair of bald eagles making a home in the cove. Uh, the last area is uh, North Carolina wildlife engagement. Um, it seems that even I understand that not only the Hickory police get lots of calls, and thank you, Chief, for the time you spent with me the other day. I learned a lot. Uh, Hickory police are getting called, wildlife is getting called, the sheriff's offices are getting called, but unfortunately we have um, two jurisdictions and two enforcement agencies and there is absolutely no overlap there. Uh, Hickory City Police cannot enforce anything beyond the shoreline and while wildlife is sympathetic to Hickory City ordinances and what they mean to the residents living in the area, they have no authority to enforce our city ordinances. Um, the recommendation that I have, uh, I have learned that uh, last summer uh, House Bill 186 was introduced uh, by representatives from uh, two different counties and Lake Norman now enjoys uh, the passage of this bill which allows municipalities around Lake Norman to enforce their city ordinances 2,500 feet beyond the shoreline. And so my recommendation is if we can study this, I don't think you can piggyback onto bills that are already passed, but there's a precedent set and I certainly think that could serve as a good model that we could uh, learn from and perhaps use. And that's all that I have at this point. And I'm happy to volunteer if there's further work to be done and do anything I can to help with the issue. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I don't have a question. I'd just like to make a comment that this seems to be a jurisdiction issue, and I understand that, that our police department really can't enforce anything, so uh, I'd like to see us further explore this matter with, with perhaps our attorneys and, and the legal minds to see what, if anything, we can do to help correct this. Mainly, my concern is from a safety uh, aspect, obviously, uh, the endangerment of the birds and the wildlife and that, but more, even more so than that is the endangerment to, to people that might be victim of a stray bullet. So uh, I'd like to ask, make a motion that we further study this and get some input from the folks that uh, can handle that. Uh, I'll second. I'll, yeah, I'll second it, yeah. Uh, all those in, we'll have a motion by Hank Guess and a second by Mr. Leo, all those in favor say aye. Aye. And Mayor Wright is not here. I'm Jill Patton filling in as Mayor Pro Tem. And Danny Seaver is also not here this evening. Um, motion passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, so I would assume we would look into the bills that were already passed. through Mooresville and Lincolnton and yep. Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. That's thank, and thank you for your detailed. Re yes, your, I'm sorry, you. and your detailed research and analysis. And, and can, yeah. part, can part of that be also to, to, to follow up with Miss Smith and, and let her Scott. know what Scott. we're doing? Scott. Scott. I'm sorry, Miss Scott. Scott. I'm sorry, Miss Scott, and let her know what's going on. Yes. And, and thank you in advance for filling out an application for one of our boards and commissions yeah. because you'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are there any other persons requesting to be heard? All right. Then. Um, moved on to the approval of minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the January seventh meeting? Make a motion. Have a second. I have a motion and a second. Do all those in favor? 
Aye. All those opposed? It passes unanimously. The reaffirmation and ratification of second readings, do I have a motion? I move reaff reaffirmation on second reading. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Madam Mayor Pro Tem, if you could go back to Roman numeral 6B. Okay, excuse me. Also, the um, special joint meeting of the Youth Council and Hickory City Council on January 13th that both uh, Mr. Lell and Mr. Guess and I were in attendance. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? Make a motion. Second. A motion by Mr. Guess and a second by Mr. Lell. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. All those opposed? Yeah. Passed unanimously. Uh, consent agenda, are there any items that need to be pulled off the consent agenda? Move to be approved as uh, presented. Do I have a second? Second. Um, approved by... Quick. And second, do I have uh, all those in favor? Please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Passes unanimously. And informational items, none. new business, public hearing, I'll turn that over. Thank you, Madam Mayor, pro tem. Uh, first item of new business this evening is a public hearing, and uh, prior to the public hearing, I'll ask uh, the development director, or excuse me, business recruitment director for Catawba County Economic Development Corporation, Ms. Julie Pruitt, who's no stranger to these chambers, to come forward and uh, present uh, an exciting, uh, the announcement's already taken place, but uh, an exciting uh, agreement uh, re recognizing the expansion of uh, one of our great local companies. Well, I'd, I'd like to first thank you for allowing me to be, be with you this you evening and bring forth this incentive request. Um, I want to apologize that Scott Millar, our president, is not with you this evening. He is actually at the county board of commissioners meeting because they are hearing the exact same or or very similar to what you're going to be hearing tonight uh, for HSM, the incentive request. Um, with me tonight, though, you get you get three for one tonight. Uh, with me, I'd like to introduce Michael McNally. He is new to our staff. Uh, you. Uh, he is our Director of Existing Industry Services. He's been with us for about two weeks now, and he's going to be working with all of your existing industries. So we welcome him, and we're very excited that he's with us. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Joanna Viola, and she is with HSM. Uh, she is the Director of Financial Reporting and Compliance and Assistant Treasurer, and I'd like to ask her to talk a little bit about HSM and uh, about how big they are and how wonderful they are as a company, because, you know, they are here. They are headquartered here and they are one of our very own homegrown companies. So I, I, I'll turn it over to her until, and then I'll get into the incentive. Thank you again. I appreciate being able to be here tonight and speak to you about HSM and um, very, very excited about the opportunity that we have in front of us. Just to give a little bit of background about the company, you probably already know, but I would like to reiterate we have been in business 70 years, and during that 70 years, we've had a commitment to not only Catawba County, but Hickory. Our um, headquarters are in Hickory, downtown Hickory, and we are overall uh, company-wide close to 2,500 employees, and uh, we cover 17 states. We have almost 50 locations within those 17 states. In North Carolina, we have approximately 20 locations and uh, 1,500 employees. So we, we do have a bulk of our facilities in North Carolina. HSM has decided to um, make an investment in R&D and innovation. We are moving this expansion through um, the Foam Tech and Innovation Centers. We're focused on product development, and the reason for that is we want to lead to new products and uh, be able to expand our product market, not only as a component company, which we've been in the past, but also to a integrated solutions type of company where we're making full integrated products rather than just components and parts. So through the uh, Foam Tech and Innovation Center, we're looking at these new products. What this does is go it's going to create new jobs, new engineering jobs, new manufacturing jobs in the area. Um, these new jobs lead to salaries, additional salaries, benefits. 
uh, rippling effect into the community. The economic impact on, that, on the community for these new jobs is, um, is what we're here to talk about. This project has been a competitive project. As I said, we do have locations in other, loca in other states, um, in other counties, but with the partnership of um, HSM with the local government and the state, we felt like this was a win-win for not only HSM, but also the local, the local government, the local community um, to, to innovate, reinvest in Catawba County and, and keep our innovation centers here in Catawba County and provide those jobs. So um, we're very excited about the investment and the opportunities that uh, is bringing not only to HSM and growing our company, but also doing that with Catawba County. Appreciate it. The transformation that is occurring at HSM really is a glowing example of what Innovate Catawba envisioned. Uh, it's a transformation of the company, uh, it's a diversification of the company, but it's doing it through innovation. And they are becoming a high-tech R&D global producer. And that's exactly what we want here in our communities. The jobs, a lot of these jobs are engineering jobs. Again, exactly what we want here in the community. And I know that whenever I come before you, it's usually for a new business, but I love that I'm getting to do this for an existing business because they really are the backbone of our community and the jobs that are created. Um, in August uh, 2013, predicated upon the, sub the subsequent approval of incentives that would match a One North Carolina Fund grant and in state incentives, HSM announced that they were going to uh, expand several of their facilities within Catawba County, creating 159 new jobs and investing $3,940,000 in new facilities and uh, and equipment. So that is county in total. Specifically to the city of Hickory, that would mean the creation of a minimum of 135 new jobs. And those uh, average wages are above Catawba County's average wage, uh, some of them well in excess of Catawba County's average wage, and $1,892,000 of new investment in the city of Hickory. Um, those will be, this will be occurring at two different locations, uh, one at 2200 Main Avenue, that's just off of McDonald Boulevard, and the uh, other one at the corporate headquarters in downtown. Um, the EDC, in conjunction with city legal staff and the company, uh, bring this forward to you tonight for your consideration under North Carolina general statutes. And we propose a grant from the local governing unit of $500 for each job created and a three-year 50% grant based on realized income from new investments within each jurisdiction. Uh, HSM would receive a one-time grant of $1,000 for each job and it would be $500 from the jurisdiction where the job is created and $500 from the county. Uh, some of their expansion is occurring in Conover and they've already uh, approved a like incentive agreement to what you're considering tonight. So really it was a partnership to try to get to the local match of the state incentives. Um, in addition to that, um, that $500 per job would be paid one time annually after the jobs are created. So I want to make sure that that's noted, that it's after the jobs are created and certified, they would receive the money. And then a 50% grant based on tax receipts of the new investment that's made within the jurisdiction. Um, there is a cap in the grant. The maximum incentive payment by the city is, would be equal to up to $82,690. From the county, $110,839. And from Conover, $23,300. And together, from those jurisdictions, partnering together would, would actually match the state grant that has been offered by the North Carolina Department of Commerce. And the state felt like this, was, this merited a grant because it was a competitive project, because it could have gone to any of the facilities that HSM has across the nation.
Um, I'd like to, in, to point out, as with all of your incentive agreements, everything happens after the fact. So nothing is given up front. Uh, the incentives are paid after the jobs are created and certified and after the investment is created and certified. So I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, entertain any discussion or uh, uh, open the public hearing? Oh. I need to open the public hearing. Yeah. Uh, open the public hearing and the rules of public hearing. We no cheers, no cheers, no anything like that. We ask that you keep your uh, speaking to three minutes. There's three minutes pro con, and we do the against the proposal first, and then for the proposal, and then there's a rebuttal period. So, um, is there anyone who would like to speak against this proposal? Seeing no one like to speak against it, is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? If not, I close the public hearing and ask for discussion and a motion. It would be approved. I have a motion for approval by Mr. Meisner. Second. And a second by Mr. Lale. <coughs> All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Our second uh, item of new business will move to department reports. And I'd like to ask uh, local architect Scott Mitchell to come to the podium. Uh, by way of background, um, the, the city of Hickory uh, owns the convention center and uh, it is operated under a board uh, that's statutorily created that is uh, appointed by you all in the city of Conover, known as the Tourism Development Authority. Um, the TDA enlisted the services of uh, Mr. Mitchell uh, about, a month or, about a month ago, um, formalized that contract recently, and uh, he is in the process of uh, designing a parking deck, uh, which has been identified as the most critical need for the convention center. Uh, success creates parking problems. Uh, we've got a number of great events, and I want to recognize B.B. Leach, who's the executive director of the TDA and CVB, those two merged entities. Uh, so as Ms. Leach and her staff are successful in bringing events here, uh, we have times when parking is beyond what the parking can accommodate. And I think everybody who's driven down I-40 or in that vicinity during certain shows realize that the parking is a mess. Uh, so it's been identified as, as the most important capital investment to uh, continue to have a successful convention center. And uh, Mr. Mitchell is going to present the concepts and designs to you all. Uh, ultimately, City Council will be asked to uh, enter into the funding relationship to pay for this, and I'll give a little bit of background on that before uh, Mr. Mitchell goes through the, the details. The convention center is completely supported, 100% supported by the occupancy tax, which is collected by all of the hotels in Hickory and Conover. So when people spend the night in a the hotel, they pay 6% in an occupancy tax. Uh, those funds are collected by the city of Hickory, remitted back to the Tourism Development Authority to run the, the convention center and to fund projects like this. Uh, it's also funded by the revenues generated by events. So as the space at the convention center is rented out for various events, uh, those revenues also funded. Um, we're in a very enviable and unique situation here in Hickory in that our convention center does not require any general tax revenues from the city of Hickory. Uh, that is not the case throughout the state. Uh, my counterparts around the state as we meet and discuss issues um, are constantly struggling with how much of their general tax funds need to support their convention center. So I think this body and the body before you all sitting here that originated the convention center were very wise in the way they went about doing that, the way they established it. The parking deck project that Mr. Mitchell will present to you this evening is planned to be 100% funded by the occupancy tax. You recall about two years ago, um, this members of city council and others went to the general assembly uh, at that time other communities were increasing their occupancy tax 
Uh, we asked the General Assembly to increase our occupancy tax from 5% to 6%. Uh, they agreed to do that. That additional 1% was identified for capital projects like this and specifically for the need of a parking deck. It's been set aside. It's collected, set aside. Uh, Ms. Leach accounts for that every month in the TDA meetings. That will be kind of the down payment on the parking deck, if you will, the funds that have already been collected. Uh, the analysis of the debt service payments to fund the, the deck uh, indicate, and Mr. Wood's been to the uh, TDA meetings a couple of times and gone over the financials with them and, and looked at the uh, financing. Again, all to be supported by the occupancy tax. So the plans that you'll hear tonight do not need or anticipate any general funds from the city of Hickory. Now that long explanation being made, you all still own the convention center, so at the point in time when the debt is issued, that will all come back to you, and Mr. Wood will stand before you and go through all of the financials and explain to you exactly how it's all going to work. Uh, you all will need to take action to actually borrow the funds, and then they'll be used to uh, construct the, uh, the parking deck, and then as the revenues come in, uh, from the occupancy tax and from parking. One of the decisions that the, the uh, TDA board has made is to charge events, certain events for parking. Events that generate a lot of public parking need are actually have already begun being charged for, for parking. So that's another one of the revenue sources that will accrue to the convention center. So ultimately you will uh, enter into a financing agreement to do that. Uh, that will be uh, coming up in the next month or so, but we wanted to have Mr. Mitchell come before you and present the, the drawings and uh, answer any questions, and I'll be happy to answer any questions before he does about the financing or the relationship there. Okay, if not, Mr. Mitchell. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks, Council. I'm fighting the cold, so I apologize, but <clears throat> I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to uh, still be practicing and be given the opportunity to work on this project some 16 years after uh, doing the original building. So it's, uh, it's a pleasant surprise to keep working on this. Um, as Mick said, BB, the council, the authority, and myself been working for several months. And I want to show you our thinking so you'll have a background to the conclusion we came to. And uh, I love doodling, so this is giving me the opportunity. <laughs> I get old school. Uh, you're looking at an aerial photo of the convention center. Interstate 40 is at the bottom of the page. Uh, Fairfield, the Hampton, the Marriott, and the Auto Zone at the top. Uh, the convention need, needs more space. They're successful, uh, they're landlocked. And the only place really to expand the center is to the west into the existing parking lot. So the parking deck needs to come first. We need to replace the spaces that are ultimately going to be displaced by any addition that happens. And the most logical place to put the parking deck is in the front. Uh, the uh, existing lots tear us down. <coughs> The hill. <clears throat> this first uh, lot being about four and a half to five feet below the floor level, and then the next lot being about eight uh, feet below the floor level. So we're planning on covering those two terraced surface lots with a one story. Uh, precast concrete parking deck. Since they tear us down, it, it doesn't stick that far above the existing floor level. The top deck will be approximately four to five feet above floor level. Uh, so it, you know, it, uh, it's submissive to the, uh, to the uh, convention center. It's gonna be able to look over the top of it to still see the convention center and hopefully make the the uh, entrance still visible at the, the focal point. Now we're doing several things besides the parking deck to, uh, uh, to incorporate in this project. Uh, we're wanting to make the, uh, the odd little triangular intersection there a true traffic circle. And we're closing this little road in front of the convention center 
at a point that will still allow trucks to come in and back into the load dock and then, and then come back out. We're going to use this road to ramp up to the upper level of the deck, which will keep from displacing any parking spaces on the existing lot. Once you get onto the upper deck, you've got a, a one-way flow pattern and then back out. By changing this little triangle, you can enter under the deck to the surface lot and do a one-way pattern back out. Uh, so we've simplified the traffic patterns and we've displaced the fewest parking spaces that you can and, and still do this deck. Uh, we're also wanting to create a third drop-off lane in front of the uh, entrance and put some more cover over that entrance. Right now, there's no cover over the doors at all, maybe six inches to a foot. So we're going to bring out a little translucent uh, uh, cover uh, out about five or six feet. <coughs> gets it closer to the drop-off lane and also gets some cover over the doors uh, to the side of that main entrance. <coughs> Questions? I, I, have, I have a question. You're probably going to answer it anyway. But uh, you talked about the future expansion of the building to go in the parking lot to the west now that exists. The obvious question is: once that's done, are we back in the same situation that we're in right now, with not having an ample parking for for the facility? Because the facility obviously is going to grow in the future. So when it grows and, and takes that it, it takes that parking lot, how are we going to accommodate that, or is this going to be enough to accommodate that also? No, it'll it'll still need to be some, have some additional parking, depending on the size of the addition, which nobody knows right now. But uh, this is flat, and the best place to put the building addition. Any further parking would have to happen by paving that gravel lot or putting a deck. Uh, and behind the convention center. So there are plans to do that. Is, is it feasible at this time that, or is it possible in the future to add a third deck to this, ex once this is built, can you add on to it, or is that something you have to do at the beginning? Well, we're not designing it for an additional floor because we feel like you go up any more and all you're going to see is a parking deck on the state court. Uh, this is the most uh, economical way to get some parking spaces now and phase in any future parking with that building addition. How many additional spaces does that offer? This gets an additional 157 spaces. Um, yeah, you can go out there and there'll be that many people parked on the road. <laughs> <laughs> it, it may be just uh, like, like say it's phase one. Yeah. To uh, alleviate some of the problems. If you have the, you say a future perhaps deck and the gravel area, how many spaces would that mm -hmm. generate if you did a deck back behind? Oh, uh, that's uh, in a neighborhood of 200 per level. Depends on how many levels you got. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that slopes up the hill, you can actually get two levels from the existing parking lot until you get to that gravel. Uh, so you could get as many as 400 parking spaces in an additional day. And, and that's part of the current property? It is. I think. <laughs> that's a, uh, there's a lot of property lines in there, but I think it could, it's either City of Hickory air rights or uh, you know, a joint plan unit development. But the uh, convention center does control that and that. They may not own it, but they control it. Now. <coughs> well, this will give you an indication of uh, an aerial view of what the parking deck would look like. You're seeing Interstate 40 at the bottom of the sheet the existing entrance, you'd ramp up where the 
existing drive is now and one level deck with uh, three cast concrete expander panels, which hide the cars instead of right. We're using a solid concrete panel and then brick piers below just to keep from destroying the existing parking lot below. Uh, purposefully understated just to uh, like I say, we don't want to take away from the convention center. We are going to take the opportunity to put some signage on that corner, which would be close to Interstate 40, uh, light it at night, and again, light the uh, traffic island and the entrance. Uh, we picked out a little it's upscale LED pole that actually glows at night instead of having uh, down light, your typical box parking lot light. These actually just emit a soft glow. So this whole uh, entrance area will just glow instead of having a harsh, sharp light. And this gives you a close up view of the uh, the entrance itself. We're bringing out a little acrylic covering over the existing art so we don't destroy any of the original features of the entrance. The drop off lane that gets you closer to the front door. And you can see an indication there of the pole lights that would uh, light that entire area. And uh, coverings on the side of the same green uh, standing seam metal roof that would cover the the secondary doors and the entrance to, to the TDA. Planning on some kind of feature in that traffic island, but that's something we can determine. Like, get an artist group or sculpture or flags or something, we'll, we'll work on that issue. Statistics on that: the um, current parking is 759 spaces. With this uh, construction, you'll end up with 916. Uh, one interesting point: the way the building was added on to actually put the entrance in the location of the least parking spaces. So right now. There's only 125 that are within 250 feet of the entrance, which is a comfortable walk, but people don't like to walk anywhere beyond 250 feet. Once you get the deck, you'll have 221 spaces that are within 250 feet. So a lot more comfort, a lot more usability. The uh, committee also decided to make these full size spaces, which is important. Most parking decks will cut the space size down to eight foot nine inches or eight foot six inches wide. These are full size uh, nine foot by 18 foot spaces. We're also choosing to paint it. Most parking decks are not painted. Uh, this, this will make it safer, lighter, uh, brighter at night. So we've, uh, we've upgraded the typical parking deck. And everybody's going to ask you how much it costs per space, which is a, a difficult question. Because typically, if we were building that new, it'd be a 303 car parking deck, because you count the ground floor and the elevated floor, which in this case you can't really do. I mean, we're upgrading that lower level, we're doing stuff to it, but it's there. Um, so it, on a traffic or on a cost per car basis, it's either 6,500 a car or it's 12,000 cars, depending on how you look at it. But it's somewhere in the middle. It's probably, if you counted what's already there, it's somewhere in the territory 9,000 per car, which is a very economical debt. They're usually in the 15,000 per car territory. So you're getting a lot of your money in that location. How many of those would be handicapped spaces? 
Uh, there'll be the code uh, amount of space left. There's actually already handicapped spaces on the lower level on the grade that we're not going to uh, destroy. So we'll be adding uh, about five more spaces close to the entrance on that existing uh, elevated deck. So you won't be putting any of the handicap up? It'll all stay on the low level? All, okay. It'll all be on the ground level. Okay. Will you be able to access the, the lower deck and the upper deck pedestrian-wise? Pedestrian-wise, there are stairs, two sets of stairs that would get you from each level to the front door. There's not an elevator because we don't have any gap spaces on the upper floor. So we're not going to that expense. See, we haven't forgotten anything. So if you're parked on the ground level and you want to go to the entry, you walk. You can walk out of. The, there'll be a sidewalk to walk out of the deck at the entry and then up the side, up, up a sidewalk. You don't have to go navigate through a deck upstairs to the top level of the deck. No. That's the uh, the main uh, stair tower is at this corner of the deck. Mm -hmm. From the ground floor, you go up half a flight of stairs mm -hmm. and you'll be on ground level to the entry. And From the upper deck, you go down, down. half a flight. So it's kind of like the split level. But, but if you're parked on that lowest level down closest to I-40, yeah, there. Yeah, you'd have to get to that access point okay. walking underneath the deck and then up those stairs. Okay. Do you walk through traffic or do you walk on a pedestrian designated area such as a sidewalk? No, you'd be walking in the drive aisles of the parking deck just like you would a typical parking deck. Yeah, there's no, no access within the deck uh, for pedestrians. You have lots more drawings. Do you not want to pull them? Well, I didn't want to get too detailed. Well, I think you have you got the one that shows the corner and the view from I-40. I think that's that's something that the committee and the and the TDA board spent a lot of time on because we were very concerned about how is the overall facility going to look from I-40. And you might want to turn that one around so the audience can see it while we're looking at the other. One. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was trying to keep them in the dark. <laughs> well, we don't want to do that. <laughs> we need some help. You got it. from the southernmost point or southern lane of Interstate 40 just to show a close-up of that corner. And this would be the uh, northeast corner of the deck. Because those two lots terraced down, you've got an elevation there of about 11 feet. And we're going to fill that below the concrete spandrel with a aluminum grid and have the letters of the building lit, backlit on that corner so you can see them day and night, large enough to catch somebody's attention was going 70 miles an hour. <laughs> and uh, so that'll be an opportunity for signage on that, that corner. And then uh, I glossed over the stair tower, which is next to the, this gives you a bird's eye view. The, you see the entrance to the existing uh, convention center. And this is the stair tower that would be featured on that corner. Down half a flight from the upper and up half a flight from the lower deck and you can cross the uh, entrance drive there to get to the front door. So is it my under the deck's got a covered way to get to within 30 feet of the front door. And it is covered on the, um, it's got a top to the stairwell. The stair tower does have a top to it, yeah. 
and that gives you an indication of the traffic circle and some opportunity there for some, some art. I got some more if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to fill you with uh, too much uh, minutia. <laughs> I, I don't have any more questions. I do hear uh, constantly a compliment from folks that use the convention center regarding parking is that unlike other convention centers and parking areas, there's no charge for parking. And I don't know who's responsible for that, but I hear that as a compliment a lot of times concerning the convention center. Yeah, there is actually a lot of debate about that and it's value when you're recruiting events, but also the fact that you do pay for parking everywhere else. It's very, it's customary, you're used to that. Nobody pulls in a parking deck anywhere not expecting to pay. Um, but, but ultimately the board made the decision that they would charge the events as much as possible and not the individual people parking. So as an a, a event uh, creator comes in, in their contract will be a charge for parking that will contemplate the number of people that they'll bring in. So, so far anyway, that's, that's uh, the approach that the board's taken, but they've recognized that at some point uh, it may make sense to charge for parking. So Mr. Mitchell outlined, you know, other, other needs that will eventually evolve at the convention center as we're successful and continue to grow that facility. You know, at some point that, that may be uh, on the table for a revenue source. Yeah, one, in that respect, I think we, uh, by doing that traffic circle and we go in the way you get in and out of those decks. We are extending conduit down to that entrance so that if in the future you can put a uh, ticket counter and guard arms and start charging. There'd be two points of access when you do this deck, the one in the front and the one at the very back so we can have some uh, control over that if you ever need to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. The next departmental report, I'll ask uh, Mr. Warren Wood to come to the podium and present uh, his quarterly financial report to City Council. Mayor Pro Tem Patton, uh, members of City Council, Mr. Barry, Mr. Crone, we've got uh, six months behind us through this fiscal year, so it's a good time to stop and see how we are doing comparing to previous fiscal years. We'll take a look at um, our two major funds, the general fund, which contains about 50% of the city's financial activity, and then the uh, water and sewer fund, which contains about 25% of the city's financial activity. So we'll, and then we'll close by looking at a couple of issues that are on the horizon or that we're dealing with currently. General fund summary, with 50% of the year complete, uh, July through December, <coughs> looking at revenues year to date, year to date we've received 59.5% of our revenues, our five year average says we ought to be at about 56.7, so we're doing pretty good. We're beating our five year average, that's good. Uh, on the revenue side, it's a good sign. On the expenditure side, we have spent or encumbered 49.5% of our uh, expenditures and our year-to-date average says we ought to be over uh, 50, closer to 51. So we're doing better on the expenditure side. When you boil all that down, take the encumbrances out, just look at your revenues over or under expenditures. We have collected $6.1 million more in the general fund than we've spent. Our five-year average says it would be at 4.1 million, so that's good. So just a question you know, that I'm asking, are we starting to feel some tailwinds on the local economy with some of our revenues? I mean, I, I don't know if we are or we aren't, y'all can make those judgments, but you know, a case could be made that we're starting to see a little bit, and there's gonna be a few more slides I'll show that might uh, lend some support to that as well. Uh, on the water and sewer fund side, we'll look at that same kind of setup. Revenue side, we're at 46% uh, year to date received. Five year average says we ought to be at 46%, so we're right on, on target there. On the expenditure side, we're 46.8% uh, expended uh, or encumbered. Five year average says we ought to be at 47.8, so we're doing a little better. The bottom line in the water and sewer fund through the first six months, revenues over or under expenditures, we've collected uh, $940,000 more than we've spent. The five-year average says we should be at 348,000. So again, it's good news in both the general fund and the water and sewer fund uh, through six months. We'll look at a couple of things specifically that we're seeing. Um, sales tax. The you can see the trend since 
obviously, you know, we were, we were doing okay through here, uh, in 03, 04, all the way up to 08, 09, and then we know what happened then. Uh, then 09, 10, it drops off, but we've seen some, we continue to see some recovery on our sales tax, uh, sales tax revenues. Now some of this is, you know, the, your market basket goods are gonna incrementally increase every year, so some of that is, is in this equation too, but, but again, we're seeing, we're going in the right direction on, on sales tax. Uh, so we've seen some recovery over the last uh, four or five years, and we're, we're seeing that again this year. So that's, that's good news uh, through the first six months. We feel good about that. Building permitting activity. I always have to explain this. This is a, about a 10 year um, trend through, this is, this is uh, July through December. Um, there's a $30 million uh, Catawba Valley Medical Center permit in here, kind of skews this number. But really, what we saw since the recession was really a pretty downward slope in our building permitting activity. But look what we're, look what we're seeing. We're at four, almost 41 million through the first six months. Um, last year, for the whole year, we did 48 million. And we've been averaging about 50 for the last uh, four or five years. So we're starting, you know, I don't know if this is a blip, if this is gonna be sustained, but I'm, I'm, we're starting to see some better numbers uh, in our permitting. We're back to where we were, you know, close to where we were before the, uh, the recession hit through the first six months. So I'm saying that's, that's a good sign. That's one we always look at. Our permitting numbers, that tells us what's going on in the local economy in terms of confidence in people building, and, and, and that's, a, that's a good number that, that we will take. Any questions so far? Um, next slide. Next. Okay. That's good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to switch that. Oh, thank you. That will end the positive part of our discussion <laughs> <laughs> this evening. It, it, it was over that quick. So, so you're going to sit down now? Yeah, I, I should. Um, there's been a lot of discussion at the state level on, you know, we fought the battle with sales tax and the, the state was going to look at the way they were, you know, the, the whole income tax structure and relying more on sales tax and what that was going to do to us. We weathered that storm. I feel, you know, I feel like I'm crying wolf up here again, but, but there's a, dis oops, there's a dis discussion going on at the General Assembly. Last week, the General Assembly's Revenue Laws Study Committee uh, met to discuss this topic, and it was not, there wasn't a lot of warm fuzzy about privilege license in the state of North Carolina uh, in, that, uh, in that meeting. The general consensus among the committee members was that the privilege license tax was unfair, and that's true, to some degree it is unfair, uh, and it needed, either needed to be repealed or significantly limited. And our position, and the North Carolina League's position, is that it needs to be reformed. And primarily since a large part of the revenue received through the privilege license tax uh, is generated by national retailers. I mean, folks in Bentonville, Arkansas, write part of the check that we get uh, for uh, privilege license tax. So we are, we're exporting part of our tax. And, and I, would, I would argue that if you eliminate the privilege license tax, you're not gonna see prices drop at Walmart as, as a result of it. I mean, that's, that's the argument that, that we're making. Uh, and just what it means to the city of Hickory in terms of the numbers and the, the dependency we have on this, it produces over, for the city of Hickory, it produces over 1.1 million annually in revenue. That is a significant amount of revenue for the general fund. And this equates to about 2.5 cents on the city's property tax rate. Um, so that's a large chunk of change. We have, uh, we do not have the budgetary capacity to absorb this total loss if it were to completely go away. I mean, that, that is, if that happens this coming fiscal year, that's something through the budget process that we're gonna have to have a conversation about how we're gonna handle that. 50% um, of this 1.1 million, again, comes from the national big box re retailers. Now the other 50% comes from local companies and, and however, the largest, uh, you'll see the, the local folks are paying the, le the lesser amounts and the, the national retailers are paying the larger chunks. And they, they could range anywhere from 50,000 uh, for a large big box retailer down to, to, to $10 for, for a smaller company. So it, it, it is, I would agree that it, it is somewhat unfair. There are a number of businesses that are exempted because their lobbies are stronger than other people's lobbies. You know, doctors, lawyers, uh, dentists, um, re uh, real estate real agents, and on down the line. So there is a level of unfairness that needs to be fixed, and it's just a matter of how we're going about fixing it. So that's that's what we're going to be talking about as we go through the budget development process um, this coming year. We'll know more about what the state 
is going to do hopefully in the meetings that they've got uh, upcoming it will give us some idea but the league is down there uh, fighting for us on that any questions about the privilege license tax or okay read in the paper today about an article about the status of the new ladder truck that we had previously ordered. I want to kind of run through a little bit of the history related to that and where we are or where we think we are. Um, the fire department did a pretty extensive analysis of a number of aerial ladder trucks uh, beginning of 2013. I think they looked at seven and ultimately agreed or recommended that uh, the American LaFrance proposal was the best one. Um, and. and we entered into an agreement with American La France. It came to City Council March 5th, 2013, the total cost of 747000 We felt like that was a good value and a good, a good quality truck. In the paper talked about it today, the first truck uh, apparatus we ever had was an American La France back in uh, 1914. And that's a company whose name has been around since 1873. It's been bought and sold a couple of times, but the name is what used to be the gold standard in, uh, for fire apparatus. And, um, but anyway, that was done by city council in, uh, in March in terms of entering into the, an agreement. We, we took advantage of a prepayment discount of $17,000. And the reason we did that is we have a performance bond in place on this purchase. The state of North Carolina does not require performance bonds for purchase of equipment, but we chose, since this was a $750,000 uh, expense, we chose to go out and, and get a performance bond as surety against non-performance by American La France. Well, guess what? That's, that's where we're, we're going with this. So there was a level of, it goes against my nature to do a prepayment, but having this in place gave me a little sense of surety. And I made the decision to yes, or gave the approval to do the prepayment, because the idea was to, to take the $17,000 in savings and, and use that towards the purchase of equipment that would go on the truck. So that's a little bit of history on how we got there. Uh, oh, and just uh, quickly, the, the, performance, the bonding company is um, Westchester Fire Insurance Company out of uh, Pennsylvania. They're an A-plus superior rated company. That's the highest you can get in the insurance business. They've got $2 billion in assets. They are a legitimate, you know, strong, uh, well-regarded uh, bonding company. So I feel good about, good about that. That's a little bit of history. And, I had, and we did that research before we got the bond because we wanted that assurance that um, that they were going to be there to, to help us if something happened. The truck was to be delivered October 2013. However, um, additional time was granted because they relocated uh, plants in South Carolina. So the fire department um, uh, verbally gave them a, an okay to work with them. Yeah, we'll give you an, some extra time to uh, a lot to account for the, 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 the switching of plants, which slowed the production down this particular this particular uh, truck. Um, along the way, between March of last year and December of this year, staff, fire department staff, made two trips to the plant in South Carolina to find out the status of our truck and make sure everything was coming along as we expected, all the way down to making sure serial numbers that were stamped on the truck matched up with the work order so knowing it was our truck. All that was done. We did all the due diligence along the way. The last trip was made in the middle of December and no indication that anything was wrong, everything was fine. The, the truck was going to be shipped to Pennsylvania to have the ladder put on it in January. We were to receive the truck by the end of March. That was, the, that was what we were told and what we had understood. Um, over the course of the weekend, we received word that American La France had ceased manufacturing operations or at least closed their doors. I, the articles that I've read have not said anything about bankruptcy. Uh, fire department staff made numerous calls down to the, the folks in South Carolina, finally got a warm body to talk to, and we, we, we uh, received word that we should be hearing from the VP of American La France by the end of this week to let us know the status of our truck and, and what its disposition is and wh where we go from here. Now that was verbal over the telephone, so we will see by the end of this week if, if any of that comes to pass. However, given all that, tonight we would like for City Council to take some action just to start the legal process, just in case, uh, to declare American La France in the fall of the contract because technically it was due, it was, the truck was to be due by, the, uh, by October and they have, in, in essence, defaulted on that per, the con per what was written in the contract. So we would like y'all to take uh, action uh, on that tonight and declare them in default so we can notify the bonding company of that, which is a requirement in the, in the bond. 
There's, there's a number of different scenarios, but three, you know, three of the maybe better scenarios would be American will France will complete the truck and deliver it. And within the bond, there's a year warranty on workmanship. So we would have a year's worth, to, we would still be able to go back to the bonding company if we got this truck from American La France and if there are any problems with it in the first year, we'd be able to go back to the bonding company and make that right. So that's also in the bond. Second option is the bonding agent will contract for the truck to be completed. And that's an option that they have in the bond. That's an option, but this, everything else still holds up. We still have a year's worth of warranty uh, on the truck that they have to stand behind or the bonding agent would reimburse the city of Hickory. So those are just three scenarios that we're looking at, but we need to start the, because with the bonding agency, we're not filing a claim, it's really you're starting a legal process. So by declaring them in default in terms of American La France, that's what we would start here tonight. And that's, any questions on that? I know I ran through that. Once we would declare them in default, then what is the process? We would start with the bonding company? Yeah, we would send a letter to the bonding, and Ms. Dula already has it, written up, just waiting for approval tonight, um, notifying the bonding company that they have been declared in default. Um, and that, because that is a requirement, we have to submit to them after it's done, we have to tell the bonding company that then they would contact us and then we'll start the process of how we're gonna rectify this. Once we do that, if we elect to do that, does that in any way prohibiting them from going ahead and delivering the truck on their no, own? No, it does not. And we hope we hope they do. Okay. And matter of fact, the, the conversation that was had on the telephone today is that the hope is that for every piece of equipment they've got in process of being constructed will be completed and we will receive our order. What about a warranty after that um, well, for the, the life of the truck? <coughs> the, one of the things that I read is that, the, that American La France is gonna have a third party uh, company that will stand behind their warranties as well as uh, service and parts. So that was that was in an article. I mean, a lot of those things we need to we need to get in writing. We need to understand all that. So this is just kind of hearsay. What I'm reading in the paper at this point. Are we are we pleased that this is the truck we want? It well, it was the truck we wanted in March, and I, it is. To, and that's a good point because this. I mean, there's also the financial you know, ramifications sure. of this. Operationally, we need that truck. We were replacing a truck that has come to the end of its useful life. So, I mean, it, it's it's a matter of, of needing uh, needing this apparatus, and yes, we do need it. Okay. Yes. So it's worth it to yes. eventually get yes. the truck. Yes. Yes. Okay. And our other two ladder trucks are American La France trucks, by the way. Any questions? No, I I, I would move that we declare American La France involved. I'll second that. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. It passes unanimously. Right, thank thank you. Uh, appointments to boards and commissions. Are there? I believe there is. There are recommendations for the University City Commission. Before you do that, I have one for the Community Relations Council. I'd like to. Uh, Appoint Patricia Bowman to the Community Relations Council. Do I have a second on that? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, pass this unanimously. And I turn this over to uh, Mr. Zangarulli. The uh, subcommittee has selected uh, Mrs. Muriel Gabriel and Mr. Ryan Edwards for the two-year terms, and Mrs. Joyce Beard and Mr. Bill McBrayer for the one-year terms for the uh, uh, University City Commission. Thank you. Does that need a second since it comes from the committee? Uh, yeah, I'll second it. Well, well I'll, move, I'll move approval of the committee's recommendation. Yeah. All those in favor of accepting? Is there a second? He's moving me a second. Do I have a second on that? Second. Thank you. All right. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Passage unanimously. Thanks for, for doing that. We have a lot of great applicants.
So I, so I saw them coming in all week. So that was, was, I'm sure that wasn't easy. No, it wasn't. Yeah. So thank you. That's, that's the most applications I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. thing, well, that, I think there will we'll be opportunity down the road for a lot of those folks to get involved. So we got a good mix of um, mostly Lenorine people and um, uh, age difference and stuff like that. So it's, it's, good. it's a good mix. Good. Thank you for your work on it. Um, petitions uh, and requests from anyone? Manners not on the agenda? General comments by members of the council, city manager? I'd like to just recognize a uh, young man that's with us this evening, Logan Shook. If you want to stand up for a second and wave. He is uh, about to complete his undergraduate degree at ASU and needed to do an internship uh, to get credit and finish that up. He's from Hudson, so we'll, he'll be with us during the spring, and uh, you'll see him around. Glad to have him. Bright young man. I think that's a long internship. Yeah. It's, it's tough to graduate from ASU these days. That's great. Okay. Um, we have a closed session tonight. Do I have a motion to... Move us into closed session. So moved. Go ahead, second. Second. All right. Thank you, Mayor, for the team.